Shalom, shalom. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Blessed is the Lord our God, King of the heavens and the earth. Amen. Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending, who was and is and is to come. He is the Lord, God Almighty. Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. That's according to Isaiah 9, verse 6, Micah 5, verse 2, Revelations 1, John chapter 1, and Colossians chapter 1. They all speak of Yeshua, Jesus, as God Almighty, as God in the flesh. Amen. I believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three, are one, according to John 14 and 1 John 5, verse 7. And I also believe that God was in Christ 2,000 years ago when he lived a perfect, sinless life. He gave himself on the cross and willingly died for our sins as atonement, as a blood sacrifice offering so that we could be saved. And then he rose from the dead three days later and ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father in glory. Amen. That essentially is the gospel message that God came to the earth in flesh. He, you know, was a humble servant. He lived a perfect life and he paid the price for our sin debt and anyone who believes in him who repents who turns away from their sins and follows his commandments will have everlasting life if they finish their race if they continue in faith till the very end now in this video I want to do a Bible study and I want to focus on a few verses here in Matthew chapter 7 uh, that Jesus said. And I want also to use the interlinearity study uh, tools, uh, which basically allows access to the Greek manuscripts and allows us to understand what the Greek words actually mean. So that way we could have a better feel for what uh, was actually being said here. Now, the translation is pretty decent, um, but I think some of the meaning has been lost in translation because, well, I don't think that the words that were translated were the best <laughs> words, in my opinion, okay? So you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a moment uh, once we begin to study the Greek words. Um, so yeah, I mean, I recommend using either the Blue Letter Bible uh, dot com or, or the app or you know something that allows you access to study the Greek and the Hebrew original manuscripts and, and what those words mean and uh, it's also good to, to compare uh, different translations uh, so that way you can get a better feel of what is being said because a lot of times it's hard to follow the old English in the King James Bible and so I just found it helpful uh, personally when studying the Bible now let's take a look at Matthew 7 verse 13 it says enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat now I don't see anything really wrong with that translation Jesus is saying here that you know enter into the straight nate the straight gate okay for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. But the interesting thing is, you know, on one hand you have a straight gate. And then on the other hand you have a wide gate. So it's like, it's kind of confusing because what, why, why is the word straight being used here? Well, let's take a look at what the word straight actually means in the Greek manuscript. Okay. This is the Texas Receptus. And here you'll see on the left is the English and over here is the Greek. And it says the straight, the word straight is from G4728, which is stainos. Now let's look at what stainos means. Uh, 
according to the Blue Letter Bible, stainos means narrow, or it could mean straight. And in the Strong's definition, it says, probably from the base G2476, narrow from obstacle standing close about, or it could mean straight. So when I see this definition, I see the word narrow. Okay, I, I don't know. I mean, narrow is different than straight. So which is it? Is it narrow or is it straight? Okay, I think personally that it means narrow. So if we read this, Matthew 7, 13, um, with the understanding that straight probably means narrow, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, enter ye in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. You see that uh, con contrast between narrow versus wide. Okay, that makes sense. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So Jesus is saying, enter into the narrow gate, the narrow way, because wide is is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction so that makes a lot more sense now if we look at the next verse matthew 7 14 uh it's even more confusing <laughs> okay so it says because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it if you read it just like it's translated kind of makes sense but it makes you know you get a better understanding if you study the greek on this okay because it says matthew 7 14 because now remember straight i believe actually means narrow so it says because narrow is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life well why did they use narrow twice well if you study the greek this word narrow <laughs> doesn't really mean narrow in my opinion let's take a look Okay, going from the Texas Receptus translation of the Greek manuscript, you see here straight is stenos, which also means narrow, and then you go down to narrow, and it's a different word, G3 or 2346, which is Thalibo. Strong's G2346, Thalibo. Thalibo. And if we look at Thalibo, we find out that this word actually means it could be translated as trouble, afflict, narrow, or to suffer tribulation. Okay, so these definitions, only one of them, or these translations, only one of them is narrow. The rest indicates some sort of tribulation or, uh, you know, affliction. Okay. So let's see what the biblical uh, usage is. Okay, it means to press as grapes, to press hard upon, or a compressed way, or a narrow straightened and contracted way. And the metaphor is to trouble, afflict, and distress. Okay, so when I read this definition, I don't see narrow. Okay, I see like hard pressed or a, a way of tribulation. Okay. So I don't think the translation on the King James isn't that great on this one. And it says here, the Strong's definition is akin to the base of G5147, which means to crowd, literally or figuratively, or to afflict, narrow, throng, suffer tribulation, or to trouble. And uh, you see here, According to Sayer's Greek lexicon, it's related to to press as grapes, to press hard upon, a compressed way, narrow, straightened, and contracted, okay? Or to trouble, afflict, and distress. So when I see this word, salivo, being translated as narrow, it, it doesn't really jive, all right? So let's take a look at that sentence one more time. Now, Matthew 7, 14, if we exchange the words straight for narrow, 
and the word narrow for hard pressed, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, so Matthew 7 14, because narrow is the gate and hard pressed is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So that makes a lot more sense. You get a lot more of the picture in terms of the true Christian walk. Okay, it is a narrow gate, but it's also hard pressed. Now, if you read it as the way that it was translated, you don't get any sense of it being hard pressed or full of tribulation. You just see that it's a, a straight and narrow way, which doesn't you know, necessarily mean that it's difficult. But whereas if you use the word hard pressed, you figure out, well, it's, it is difficult, okay? Now let's take a look at some other verses. Okay, so let's start from Luke 13, verse 23. Now this is Jesus teaching, and somebody asked him, it says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, which we know now probably means the narrow gate. So strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. Okay, so, so that, you know, it, it's not really a terrible translation, but if you actually study it with the word narrow instead of straight, it makes a little bit more sense. Because if it's a narrow way, you know, it's, it's harder to find. Uh, it might be a little bit more difficult than the broad way. Alright? And then it says, Luke 13, 25, When once the master of the house is risen up, and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. So Jesus is giving them a parable. And then he said, Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. So, you know, Jesus is saying, You know, when the master of the house, you know, has risen up or has come and, and shut the door, then you know, you begin to stand without and to knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. So Jesus given them a parable about the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying that he's going to lock certain people out of the kingdom of heaven. And then they say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me all ye workers of iniquity. Now, iniquity is just a fancy word of, of sin. All ye workers of sin. All right, let's take a look at that. It's G93. And it means injustice, unrighteousness of heart and life, or a deed vi a deed violating law and justice, an act of unrighteousness. And the strongest definition is an injustice, morally, wrongfully, iniquity, unjust, unrighteousness. Okay, so it's, you know, because they lived a bad life, because they're unjust in their conduct. They were morally wrong, okay? That's why Jesus will say, I know you not. Okay. And then it goes on to say, there sh Jesus says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when, when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves are thrust out. Okay. So here we see that Jesus is saying, okay, the way is narrow, and few there be that find it. We see that in Luke uh, 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the narrow gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able to. And then why is that? Well, Jesus reveals in this parable 
it's because they're workers of iniquity. They're workers of injustice or moral wrong behavior. Okay, so here we see that the word narrow makes more sense than the word straight. Now, oftentimes we hear about the phrase the straight and narrow. You know, it makes sense. If it's a straight line, you know, you don't move from the left or to the right, but you just go straight. That makes sense. But narrow seems to be a better word, in my opinion. Okay. Now, a lot of people today, they teach this doctrine that you're once saved and you're always saved. That all you have to do is believe in Christ and believe in his finished works and you could just sit back and and you know trust in his works well the bible actually says something different okay if you you know just see what we just read about striving to enter into the narrow way that doesn't you know that doesn't really jive with the idea that all you have to do is believe okay so i'm going to demonstrate to you using the bible that we really do have to change our life uh, to to be able to strive to enter into the narrow way okay it says in matthew 18 verse 7 woe unto the world because of offenses for it must needs be that offenses come but woe to the man in by whom the offenses cometh wherefore if thy hand or thy foot offend thee cut them off and cast them from thee it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire okay so that's a very serious uh, statement there by Jesus he's saying that I, I basically take it to mean that if your hand or your foot causes you to sin you know he, now he's speaking metaphorically or with exaggeration he's saying to cut them off and cast them from you because it's better for you to enter into life or into heaven uh you know maimed rather than having two hands or two feet uh, and then be cast into the fire so jesus is saying basically in my opinion you know do everything you can to not sin because if you continue in that sin you'll be cast into the fire now let's look at some of these words or translation comparisons okay so if you go into the blue letter bible tools you go to bibles and then it tells you the different translations and what the different translations say for this particular verse which is pretty helpful okay so let's let's read it in the new king james version if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is better for you to enter into life maimed, let lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Okay, so here in, in the New King James Version, they actually use the word sin. Okay, rather than in the King James Version, it just says uh, offend. They use the word offend instead of sin so if you read the new king james translation it makes a little bit more sense new living translation says sin uh, niv says stumble uh, esv says sin uh, fall away for a christian standard bible which i don't think is the best translation in this particular verse okay sin I think you see that you know it means sin okay now it goes on to say and if thine eyes offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire okay so again saying that if your eye causes you to sin if it you know, if, if it offends you, if it causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you because it's better to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. 
Now, a lot of these modern churches, they say that, oh, all you have to do is the ABCs. You have to believe in Jesus. You have to, you know, confess him as your savior and you have to trust in his works. Okay, they don't talk about repentance. They don't talk about striving to enter into the narrow way. So it gives these people like a false idea of the walk of salvation. Okay, so it's really diluting the word of God and it's actually sort of, dis I think it's dishonest. I think it's misleading people to say that all you have to do is believe when really you have to really strive to enter into the narrow way. Okay, because a lot of people who think that they are saved, they're actually not saved because they're still living in sin. They're still living like they used to live. Uh, but then they're also trusting Jesus, which is like a contradiction because Jesus died so that we would be free from sin, not to live in our sin. Okay, now I'm not saying that I'm perfect. Sometimes I slip up. I make mistakes, but I don't willfully sin. When I came to Christ, I gave up my new age religion. I gave up yoga. I gave up uh, pornography. I gave up fornication. I gave up idolatry. I gave up evil entertainment. I gave up pretty much everything that the Holy Spirit convicted me of. Okay? And that's what we ought to do. That That's the true conversion. If you're convicted of your sin and you feel bad when you do those sins that means you're probably at least being administered to by the holy spirit but if we continue doing those sinful things god is going to say okay i'm going to give you up to your sinful ways i'm not going to convict you of this sin and he'll give you over to a reprobate mind to be cast into the fire okay god will only tolerate it for so long in my opinion Now, I wanted to read the book of James chapter 2 and talk about how it's not just by believing, okay? And, and the book of James chapter 2 clearly shows us this, that it's more than just, you know, a mental assertion, uh, believing that Jesus paid it all by his works. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. So James is saying you don't really have faith if you're not, you know, acting on those beliefs. If you say that you believe in Jesus, but you're not following Jesus' commandments, you're not doing what he said, then you don't really have faith. It says, yeah, man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, so Jesus, uh, or James, I'm sorry, the brother of Jesus is saying, Okay, someone says that they have faith. Okay, well, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, and James 2.19 says, If thou, or thou believest, or you believe that there is one God, thou doest well, or you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. So James is saying, okay, if you believe there's one God, okay that's good but the devils also believe and tremble okay but the devils aren't saved but wilt thou know O vain man that faith without works is dead was not abraham our father justified by works when he had offered isaac his son upon the altar seest thou how faith wrought with works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only okay so we have to prove our faith through our works now Jesus also tells us 
or he gives us another parable or another teaching let me see if I could find it now this is Matthew 25 and Jesus teaching let's see and he says in Matthew 25 34 then shall the king now the king is a representation of Christ in this parable then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was a hungred and ye gave me meat I was thirsty and ye gave me drink I was a stranger and ye took me in naked and ye clothed me I was sick and ye visited me I was in prison and ye came unto me then shall the righteous answer him saying Lord when saw we thee a hungred and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily I say unto you insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me then sh uh, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for I was a hungred and you gave me no meat I was thirsty and you gave me no drink I was a stranger and you took me not in naked and you clothed me not sick and in prison and ye visited me not then shall also answer him saying Lord when uh, saw we the uh, hungered or thirst or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did I minister unto thee then shall he answer them saying verily I say unto you insomuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these ye did it not to me and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life now when he's saying that you know what you did to the least of my brethren you know is, is that it says here in Matthew 25 40 as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren is that talking about Christians or is it just talking about strangers you know I, I really don't know maybe it's just talking about Christians because it says my brethren maybe it's talking about unbelievers too I'm not really sure what we know that with the uh, the story of the Good Samaritan Jesus talked about blessing you know the strangers but I, I'm not sure if we should let a stranger into our house who is not Christian because the Bible also says you know if someone does not have the doctrine of Christ do not let them into your house lest you be a partaker of their evil deeds okay so kind of have to use discernment on how you should minister to people um, but yeah Jesus is pretty much saying that you know because of people's works or lack of works they are cast into everlasting fire it says then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye curse into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels so he's saying because of their works or because of their lack of works they were cast into the fire so here we see that salvation is not just by belief alone but it's also about our works okay which leads me to the book of revelations as the first three chapters or the first uh chapter two and chapter three it's the letters to the churches okay the the seven churches and jesus in each one of the letters uh judges the churches based on their works not by their faith but by their works it says let's just take a look here at revelations 2 this is the message to ephesus that jesus gave okay and it says I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience 
and for my namesake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So Jesus is saying here, I've seen your works, your works are pretty good, but you have left your first love. And it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So Jesus is judging them based on their works. And he's saying, I will take your candlestick. Okay, what is a candlestick? It's the spirit that God sends to the churches. It's, I believe, the, the Holy Spirit anointing, in my opinion, or, or an angel which ministers to the church, possibly. Okay, because it says here, He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks okay so christ is the one who has the seven stars in his hand which are the seven churches uh and who, or well let's read revelations one here we see in revelations one that uh, i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and death Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay, so the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, so he's saying he'll remove the, the lamp, the candlestick uh, from them. So I guess that means to take away... Uh, their position as a church uh, in the body of Christ okay so here we see again okay the first the first one Ephesus they were judged based on their works goes on to say the message to the church of Smyrna and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna uh, in Smyrna write these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive okay speaking of Jesus I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life." He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The second death is the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20. So Jesus is saying, okay, your works are good, but you have to overcome. You have to be faithful even unto death. Okay, that's, you might say that's a work. Okay, now the message to Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, uh, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Okay, you see that all of these churches are being judged by their works. Let's see what this one says. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now, I think that's talking about the spirit of Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, 
and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So those are works, okay? So Jesus is judging them on their works, on their obedience, okay? And it says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her, the Jezebel, the, the person with the Jezebel spirit, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Okay? So Jesus is saying, I'm going to cast you into great tribulation unless you repent. Okay? And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and will give unto every one of you according to your works. Okay, you see there, Jesus said, I will give to you according to your works. He doesn't say, I'm going to just give to you according to your faith. You know, he, he doesn't say, everybody's going to get the same thing because you all believe in me. He doesn't say that. Okay, he says, according to your works okay and again he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will i give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and i will give him the morning star he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches and you know the rest of the churches is pretty much the same thing okay god judges them for their works tells them what they need to do to be right with him okay how to adjust their life how to repent all right anyhow i pray this was a blessing uh, i do recommend that you find some sort of uh bible app that has you know the interlinearity you know if you want to do a more in-depth study and if you want to compare, you know, different translations, uh, you know, regarding different verses, it's very helpful. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that time is very short. We have to make sure that we are on the narrow path. We have to evaluate our lives, see if it matches up with the Word of God, with the teachings of the New Testament. And uh, let us pray that we are counted worthy to escape, Jesus said, uh, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21 verse 36 and I believe the rapture is very soon I hope to see you all up there and shalom until next time and if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior please repent turn away from your sins get baptized in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit according to Matthew 28 and follow his commandments and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and then you must continue in faith, in obedience, in good works, until the very end. And I hope to see you all in heaven very soon. And shalom. Until next time. Amen.